After Jesus' cry of Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani from the cross, it was the end of the three hours, he then cries this cry here, I thirst. And as we said, this is a statement of desire. And we made the connection back into the uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, where it says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, when you come back into the record and the story um, around the cross, you'll notice that they had already endeavored uh, to give Jesus vinegar mixed with gall to drink earlier on in the crucifixion. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 34, um, immediately after they crucified him, after they, uh, they had brought him to Golgotha, it says in verse 34, and they gave him vinegar uh, to drink, mingled with gore, and when he had tasted it, he refused to drink. And, and we know lots of really good reasons for that. Jesus certainly wanted to have his mind clear, didn't he? Um, gore was an opiate. And so um, the idea behind giving vinegar and gall was as a painkiller to relieve the pain. But Jesus, you know, as he had said to John and James, can you drink of the cup the Father has given me to drink of? Jesus knew that this cup that he would drink of would involve suffering. And he was going to bear the sins of the world and he was going to endure on the cross and to do that, he wasn't going to take any painkillers. Might be another good reason for that. Back in Jeremiah chapter 9, without going there, God says in prophecy of concerning the false prophets, I will give them water mixed with gall to drink. So one of the tests of a false prophet that God said was he would give them gall to drink because they were a false prophet. And you know, the question is, is, did the scribes and Pharisees know this? Were they aware of the prophecy in Jeremiah? And part of the giving of the vinegar mixed with gall to Jesus was as a test to show, see, there's a false prophet because God had given him uh, gall to drink. Anyway, later on, right at the end, Jesus, of course, uh, requests, a drink, and it comes from John's Gospel. And these last three sayings, or, or th as we said, three of the sayings of John, uh, John's Gospel, three of the sayings come from John's Gospel, all deal, and we mentioned this last time, with the judgment upon the serpent, going back to the story of the seed of the serpent. I just wanted to show you this slide, and, and it's something to build on, um, because we haven't got time to really look at it in depth, but in John's Gospel, the, the first saying that Jesus uses, woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother, is directly related to the woman, the promise that God made to the woman and promising her that she would eventually be delivered through her seed. The second statement, which we are going to look at now, I thirst, is directed specifically, I believe, in and around to the seed of the woman. And finally, it is finished, which we will look at, has to do with judgment upon the serpent. So the three aspects are the promise to the woman, the promise to her seed, and judgment upon the serpent are all uh, found in John's record. So let's go back to that record in John for a minute and just see the picture. So in John chapter 19... Because it's really unusual when we consider that Jesus died at 3 p.m. at the time of the evening sacrifice. He's hung on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. There's been darkness on the earth from 12 till 3. And right at this time, right at the end of the three hours of darkness, right at the time when he's about to die, all of a sudden, after crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says, I thirst. Give me to drink. Right now I need, to, now I need something to drink. Right now. Why, why was that? 
Was it simply because he couldn't get through the last two sayings? As we said, Jesus, the seven sayings from the cross have clear construct. It seems that Jesus is teaching a very powerful lesson in all seven sayings. So it says in verse 28 of John chapter 19, after this, Jesus, knowing now that everything was finished, that everything was done, and it was all accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, and that means to be completed, to come to an end, that the scripture might be fulfilled and completed, he says, I thirst. Now, there was set there a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with the vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, finished. And bowed his head and gave up the spirit. And as he gave up the spirit, as he breathed his last breath, according to Luke's gospel, he finishes with, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And that's his last dying breath. That's how we would construct the, the seven sayings. But isn't it unusual when you really think about it? It's like he, he, he's come to the very end of this trial. He's endured the end of the trial, but there's one thing. There's one thing he needs to do. And he says, I thirst. In order that the scripture might be completed, Jesus says, I thirst. And they ran and get a sponge and filled it with vinegar and gave it to him. And he drank it and said, now it's finished. It's done. Do you see that as unusual? I, I, when I first did this, I really struggled with what was going on here. Why did Jesus now need to have this drink? What was the point? Surely it's not just to finish the last saying. It is finished, by the way, as one word. It's, it's, it's done. Um, it's the word teleos. Uh, it's over. It's the end. It's only one word. Surely, you know, he's going to use one word to say one word. So why did he need to have this drink? Well, I, I struggled a bit with this, and then I found this quote in Colossians, which set me on a little bit of a study. And um, we're going to look at this for the next few minutes to see if we can get him behind what's actually happening with uh, Jesus here on the cross. So Colossians chapter 2, it says in verse 14, concerning Jesus' work on the cross, it says, blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So here was this handwriting or these ordinances, that's the, the idea of the word dogma, that was against us. They were contrary to us. These were a, a, a set of ordinances that were contrary to us, and Jesus, it says, has blotted them out. Blotted out the handwriting, and he's nailed it to the cross. And he's left them there. These ordinances, these curses that are written which were against us, and they were contrary to us. And the word to blot out that he uses, um, exalifo, means to smear out or to obliterate. It's the same word to wipe away, as in the tears, wipe away tears, or, or to blot out. So, you know, we have white out that we have. So you've got this writing, and the idea behind that is you've got this writing, and you blot out the writing. It's written there and you blot it out and you take it away. And that's what he does. He blots out the handwriting and the ordinances. And I thought, what an unusual description that um, Paul is using here in Colossians. And I looked to try to find why he should use that description. And I, it led me on an interesting connection into the Old Testament. And at first I thought I was, you know, looking at one of these real tangents, going miles off on a tangent. and um, But I kept going because I had the time to go on the study. As I looked at it, the more I looked at it, I thought, actually, this is, this is really powerful in its connection. So I want you to come back to a very unusual uh, chapter 
in the law, one which is not quoted very often. It's in Numbers chapter 5. And we haven't got time to go through it all in Numbers chapter 5, but in Numbers chapter 5, it is a section under the law known as the law of jealousies. And it's all about the jealous husband. And the story is, as we paraphrase it, is that it would seem that a man is very suspicious that his wife has been unfaithful to him. And uh, he's suspicious that, uh, that she might have become pregnant with child from somebody else. And so he was permitted under the law to bring her to a trial. A, a horrific trial, really. One of the most horrific things that you can imagine under the law where he would bring this woman to the door of the tabernacle to be presented before the priest. And, and, the, and the priest would there, uh, with the woman, uncover her head. That was the first thing that she had to do. And symbolizing the fact that all things were going to be revealed. Because she was claiming she's innocent, she's been faithful, but... Clearly, this man feels that she's been having an affair. And so, God is going to be the judge. And there's this test that she's going to endure. It's, it's quite horrific. It's, you know, almost something out of like a Harry Potter movie, to be honest. It's like the priest goes and gets water from the laver, holy water, and then he gets dirt from the door of the tabernacle, and he mixes the water with the dirt, makes this concoction, and then he writes these curses. And he, he, he writes these curses on a bit of paper against this woman. Horrific curses. Curses that would infect this woman if she was guilty and unfaithful and a liar. And then he would get a sponge and he would take the sponge and he would dip it in the water and he would dip it into the curses. And uh, the ink off the curses would be absorbed into the sponge. And he'd squeeze the sponge into the bit of water. And it's like the curses are suddenly coming into this bit of water. Horrific concoction. And then he would cause her to drink it. And it would go inside her. And if she was faithful, it had no effect whatsoever. And the end result was that she was free to give birth to a child, the child that she had. If she was unfaithful, those curses, that water, would go down and it would affect her and it would make her belly to swell. And the record says it would make her thigh to rot and she would have a miscarriage. And the child would die. And it would poison and affect, infect her. Now, it's such a horrific story in, in the Old Testament. You sort of think, why would God do anything? Why would God even have this in the Old Testament? Well, I believe it was a test to the man. You know, there's nothing worse than jealousy, is there? Who can stand before jealousy? This man, in his heart, is jealous that his wife's been unfaithful. And, and, and men, of course have been known to act in incredibly bad when they think their wife has been unfaithful. And so God puts the test, which is as much a test to the man as it is to the woman, because the test to the man is, well, what if you're right? Are you really prepared to put your wife through this experience? Are you prepared to go through this entire experience because of your jealousy? Or maybe, maybe you want to have compassion and mercy. Now, you know Joseph and Mary. Mary came under this exact law, didn't she? Joseph was not willing to make a public exhibition of Mary, to put her to a public shame, it said. That's 
the law of jealousies. He was not willing to do this, to put her to public shame. And he chose to take Mary because he wasn't, you know, like it was a tough thing for Joseph. This is before the angel came to Joseph. Before the angel came to Joseph and said, fear not, Joseph, because, you know, the child that Mary has, is going to have is of, is of the Lord. Before the angel told him that, God tested Joseph. How was he going to react? The test was to Joseph, would he be faithful to his wife? And Joseph, of course, chose not to. So here's the summary, just quickly, the, um, in the law of jealousy. The wife is suspected of infidelity, verse 13. She is brought near to the Lord. A bitter recipe of holy water and dust tests for guilt or for innocence. And it brings, uh, she's to bring a memorial offering before God, by the way. A tenth part of an ephah of flour is to be brought to the Lord as a memorial offering to God. Written curses was added by this blotting process. And she was caused to drink the bitter waters. And if, it were, if she was guilty, she would, uh, a curse would come upon her, which, reading in the record, results in a miscarriage. And if, uh, if she was faithful, innocence result, uh, and was innocent, the results in freedom and in healthy, uh, healthy children for her to be able to bear children. Verse, Numbers chapter 5, verse 27 and 28. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? There's no law of jealousy for, for the woman against the man. You don't find that in the biblical record. There's only a law of jealousy for the man against the woman. What if a man was unfaithful? What if a, what if a man was un, unfaithful to his wife? A woman could never bring the man and get him to go through the same trial and see those things that were done. David was, wasn't he? Unfaithful. David was guilty of adultery, wasn't he? Wasn't he? After the death of Uriah. What happened to David? Look at Psalm 51 for a minute. David endures the same results of Numbers chapter 5. So in Psalm 51... Have mercy on me, O God, according to the loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. See the phrase he uses? Same phrase out of Numbers chapter 5. Blot out my transgressions. Look at verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me verse 9 hide not thy face from me and blot out all my iniquities because David knew if he was put under the trial of jealousy he was guilty in every sense and what happened the child that was born to Bathsheba would die though David prayed and prayed and prayed the end result of the curse of Numbers chapter 25 came upon David not only that, before he confessed his fault, he, inside his belly, these bones, they became rotten. He became sick. He became desperately sick inside his belly and inside his bones. His sore came upon him daily. He endured the suffering of the curse of the jealous husband upon the unfaithful wife. David himself came under the curse. Not only that, Judas Iscariot. Look what it says of Judas Iscariot. May the iniquity of his fathers be remembered before Yahweh. Let not the sin of his mother be blotted out, Numbers chapter 5, but as he clothed himself with cursing like a coat, may it soak into his body like water and like oil into his bones. That's Numbers 5. That's a graphic description of the waters of jealousy soaking into your body, into your bones, going right into your belly because he loved cursing and he was unfaithful. 
And look what happened to him, of course. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst the sunder in his middle and all his bowels gushed out. Now, I believe there's a real reason that Jesus wants this drink. He's come to the end of this process. He's demonstrated his life as being 100% wholly faithful to God. He's never, ever been unfaithful to his father. Never been unfaithful to his God. And he gets to the end of this process and he says, Now, I thirst. And someone comes along and takes you know, this bitter water. And it's the same language. And they put it in an earthen vessel. And it's exactly the same language. And they take a sponge. And it's exactly the same language. It's all Numbers 5. Straight out of Numbers 5. And they put it on a hyssop, which is a cleansing agent. And they put it to his mouth to drink. And as soon as he drinks, he says, it's finished. Because he's the only man ever that could go through that process in Numbers 5 faithfully before God. Who else where God could cause somebody to go through that process? I'm a jealous husband, said God. Uh, He's jealous of his love for him. And if he put us under the trial of Numbers chapter 5, what would happen to us? Every one of us. Cursing, belly would rot, we'd die, no life, nothing. Jesus is the only man that has ever been able to take that. Sermon on the Mount, blessed are they which hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. That's what it was all about. This is the, this is the end of his sermon. Blessed are those which hunger and thirst after righteousness. Search me, O God. See if there be any wickedness inside me. Do you know why every offering under the law was examined externally? Not internally. You go and look at an offering, you see, oh, it's perfect. It's got no spots, it's wrinkles, it's an ideal sacrifice. Cut it open and it's full of worms. It's got a tumor. Something's wrong inside. You can't see that on the outside. Only God can see on the inside no matter how good we look on the outside. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. And he's come to the end of this sacrifice, and he's now saying, I'll take the water. And look what happens next in John's record, coming back to John chapter 19. In John chapter 19 and in verse 34. And then one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out of his side blood and water you know like when you when you pierce the side into into the stomach and into the bowels remember Ehud he had his stomach pierced by a sword What came out? Judas Iscariot, what came out? They came along and they pierced the side of Jesus. What comes out? Blood and water. Why? Because his entire life was sanctified and purified before God. He was completely full of just blood and water. And the record is showing us that there's nothing unclean inside. This sacrifice is perfect outside, it's perfect inside. And the proof was shown in John when out of his side came forth blood and water. Ephesians chapter 5, that he might sanctify her. Because where was the bride taken from? The side of Adam. What happened if the rib was no good? What happened if the rib was a tumor? The bride and God took that and made a transplant and built a woman out of something which had problems. Out of his side, Jesus is going to take a bride. 
and sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the ecclesia to himself in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle, with any such thing, that she might be completely holy and unblemished. Why? Because she's taken straight out of his side. Because he's completely holy, unblemished and perfect in every way, because he's never, ever, never, ever been unfaithful to his father. And David waited in the grave for this. He yearned for the time. Sacrifice and offering I could not give. I, there's nothing I can give. David knew he was dead. But he knew that God had promised a redeemer that would come and provide the way in which David could be purified and cleansed. And of course, in terms of seeing his offspring, Isaiah 53 Yet it was the will of, the, of Yahweh to crush him and put him to grief and make his soul an offering for guilt. But he shall see his offspring. He will prolong his, the, the days. The will of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. I and the children whom the Lord has given me and out of his side came forth in an ecclesia. And he shall see his offspring and prolong his days. So immediately after Jesus spoke, has this drink and says, I thirst, he was then able to follow on and these two sayings, as we say, go right with each other. He needed to take that drink. It was the final test to show that he was the perfect sacrifice outside and in. As soon as he had that test, he then was able to say, finished, done. And there's the proof. I've had the drink of the, of the bitter waters and nothing's happened. And he uses this word, teleo. It is finished. To complete, to execute. Same word which he used when he said in Luke chapter 22, I tell you the scriptures must be fulfilled in me that he was numbered with the transgressors for what is written about me to have its fulfillment, to have its completion. And then there's another quote in Isaiah chapter 53, Therefore I will divide him a portion with many. He will divide the spoil with the strong because he poured his soul out to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. That's the connection to that quote that we just looked at. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So he became representative on that cross of us and he did so by taking of those waters. And now he could say it is finished. What was finished? Well, in the 70-week prophecy in, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel sees this prophecy of the Lord where the Lord tells him that 70 weeks are, are yet determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision of the prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. Here's this, this picture in Daniel chapter 9 of pointing forward to Jesus Christ and the work of making an end of the law of Moses. And you'll notice that there's four things specifically mentioned here. It is to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation and to bring in the everlasting covenant do you know under the law of Moses there were four types of offering wasn't there there were the four major offerings that were there there was the trespass offering to make an end of transgression there was the sin offering to make an end of sin there were the peace offerings which included the, the drink offerings, which were all about reconciliation with God. It was about sharing an offering, bringing an offering where you could share together, peace offerings, and of course, the whole burnt offering, which was the everlasting righteousness, the complete burnt offering. They were the four offerings under the law. And Isaiah is referencing these when he says to make an end of transgression, to make an end of sin. and Because he says, after three score and two weeks, Messiah the Prince will be cut off, not for himself, 
but he shall confirm the covenant for many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he will cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. It is finished. He will cause all sacrifice and oblation to cease because he's the fullness of all of those offerings. Do you know, all of those offerings are there in the sayings from the cross. Those were the four offerings, weren't they? The trespass offering to finish transgression, the sin offering to make an end of sin, the peace offerings to make reconciliation, and the whole burnt offering, the everlasting covenant. Have a think about Jesus' sayings from the cross. The trespass offering. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Trespass offerings were transgressions against God, included sins of omission. The sin offering to the thief on the cross who said, we die rightly. We deserve the just reward of our deeds. With me shalt thou be in paradise. The sin offering. The peace offerings were the, the person offering the sacrifice would share in the offering. He would share this offering with the priest and with God, Mary. Yea, and a sword will pierce your own side. You will be intimately involved in the sacrifice of John. You shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, the drink offering. Mary and John epitomize the peace offerings coming before the Lord and sharing in his sacrifice. And of course, the burnt offering, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The whole burnt offering, complete dedication. All the offerings under the law are summarized as we go through the seven sayings from the cross. And no wonder at the end Jesus was able to say, it's finished, I made an end. You know, the, the whole law, not one jot or tittle shall pass until all these things be finished. And then he was able to say, it's done. Because all the offerings come to a climax on the cross. And then finally, he says these words, his final act of dedication, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's, it's one of the most beautiful things. I, I liken, you know, this statement to a father with a child that's like standing on a, a table, closing his eyes and like, catch me dad, and then falling over backward. Knowing, of course, that, you know, his father's never going to drop, never going to say, ha, ah. <laughs> let him go. The child just knows, absolutely knows, 100% confident from a very young age that they're able to close their eyes and fall backward and dad's going to catch them. Knows that dad's going to catch them. And Jesus was at this moment where he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he was going to lay down his life. You know, self-preservation is, is, is just, it, it's the most powerful thing within our being, isn't it? The desire to, you know, preserve life, to actually let go voluntarily, to let go and give his life to God. It's a beautiful statement. Of course it comes from Psalm 31. Um, which is a story of, of David when he's fleeing from Saul. When he pens Psalm 31. And it's a time where you know, if, if you go back and look. The key phrase in verse 15 of Psalm 31 is. My times are in your hands. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. My, my times, my days. I must do my father's will. While it is called today are in thy hands. My time has not yet come. Jesus was always conscious that every living, breathing hour of the day was not his life. It was God's. It was the life that God had given him. And he used every moment of the day for serving God. And the story in Psalm 31, of course, is when David is, is fleeing from Saul. And um, he, he goes up and, and hides in, uh, in Keilah, which is the... Uh, in, in the rocky, um, deep mountains, and Kila means a fortress or a, city, a citadel, and a strong place. 
And, and there's a reference to Kila in um, Psalm 31. Blessed is Yahweh, for he hath showed me marvelous kindness in a strong city. But behind this, this story of David was the fact that there was constant betrayal. He was betrayed by Doag in, in 1 Samuel 22 verse 9. He's, tra- he's betrayed by the men of Keilah who go off and tell Saul, oh, David's been here. We know where he is. And Saul comes up with all his men. So, you know, he's be- and he asked, God told him, he asked the Lord, he says, will the men of Keilah betray me? And God said, yes, they will. So he's betrayed by Doeg, he's betrayed by the men of Keilah, and he's betrayed by the Ziphites. And and so David flees from Saul, and um, and he goes up into this uh, into this mountain, and Saul comes around and surrounds it, and there's no way out, absolutely no way out. David is completely surrounded. He's down on the top of this mountain, and Saul knows exactly where he is. His whole army's there, and David's fled there, and there's no chance of him escaping. And he's trapped, completely trapped. And then at the very last minute, of course, a messenger comes to Saul and says, the Philistines have invaded. And Saul can't do anything about it. He's got his enemy trapped here, but this entire massive force is attacking the home front. And all of a sudden, Saul has to turn around and leave off his revenge and his hatred and his desire to take David and runs off back to fight the Philistines. And David's set free. And he talks about the fact that God has set him free and set his feet upon a broad place. And, and he talks in the language that God has like picked him up like an eagle and delivered him from these things. As Jesus spoke, of course, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. There was a rumbling, wasn't there, in the ground. It was a shaking in the earth. At the very same time as Jesus was crying this from the cross, as God had been right there. Because every sacrifice, you know, when, when, when Aaron was accepted as a high priest, the glory of God came down to accept that sacrifice. In the, in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. It was said that's the place where God would meet with man. There's no light inside the most holy place. Light was outside in the holy place. But what lit up the most holy place was the glory of the Father that came there and overshadowed the mercy seat. That's that's where God was. So in the darkness, while everybody's in darkness around, it says he made darkness a secret place. Who shall dwell in the secret place of the Most High? Who shall abide under the shadow of his wings, it says? And there was Jesus at the cross under the shadow of the wings of the Lord. There he was in the secret place in the Most High because God was right there. And at the very same time, Caiaphas was walking into the Most Holy, uh, walking into the holy Place to offer for the people because he was the high priest. And he was standing there before the Most Holy Place in this massive curtain. It was a handbreadth long. It took 300 priests to take down this curtain and wash this curtain. And all of a sudden, the ground started shaking. And there's this enormous noise. (laughs) And this curtain rent from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. This curtain was rent from top to bottom. Because Caiaphas had only stood there six hours or so before while Jesus had stood in front of him and grabbed his garments and ripped them and said, this is blasphemy. What furthermore do we need to hear? And now he stood there in front of the most holy place and God took the garments of the veil of the temple and went, no, this is blasphemy. And inside the most holy place there was nothing. Nothing was there. Because God wasn't there. Because God had just torn up that old covenant and he had torn through the veil, because God was out there with his son, accepting a perfect sacrifice. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Well, those are a summary of the seven sayings from the cross. And I was talking with the young people last night, and and, um, one of them was sort of mentioning um, how that Paul... uh, thought about Stephen's words uh, and used Stephen's words. And I said, you know, of course, that 
Stephen's words were couched on the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the seven sayings. And, and in Acts chapter 7, we see that, of course, because Stephen says in verse 59, as they stoned Stephen, he called upon God saying, uh, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's the, that's the last saying from the cross, isn't it? Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And in verse 59, as he died, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not the sin against their charge. That's the first saying of Jesus from the cross, isn't it? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so Jesus, uh, Stephen's words have the bookends of Jesus' sayings from the cross, which tell you that the seven sayings from the cross to the apostles was far more than just a set of sayings. They understood the seven sayings to be a way of life. And they wanted to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was careful in that selection. Well, Paul also, in Second. Timothy chapter 4 in our reading, I believe, links all seven sayings from the cross in 2 Timothy chapter 4. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, as Paul is on death row and he's waiting to be executed, and he knows that it's a, it's a very dangerous time uh, to be near Paul, and Luke was with them. They were incarcerated in Rome and Nero was slowly going mad because he drank too much water and it was full of lead and he was slowly, slowly going pretty loopy. At least that's what some people suggest. But he was definitely getting nuttier and nuttier and he had it in for the Christians. And, um, and all of a sudden what began, you know, when Paul was first uh, imprisoned in Rome, it wasn't so bad. There was opportunity to go and visit Paul freely. But by the end of his life... It was dangerous to go and visit Paul. You know, what was interesting is that Paul expected people to go and visit, dis visit him despite the danger. Um, and and that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Paul wanted people to put their lives at risk. He expected people to come and see me. He was disappointed where he turned around in Second Timothy and he made a list of all these, um, all these people that you know, had, had left him and that only Luke was there. So in verse um, 9, he says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, I, I want you to do your diligence to come to me. But it's like, well, isn't it dangerous, Paul? Don't you think it's a little bit dangerous? Should I, should I really come to visit you? you know, it's highly likely Onesiphorus has been killed. You know, he talks about, you know, paying tribute to the household of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus went to visit Paul in, in prison, and he wasn't ashamed, he said, of his chain. He wasn't ashamed to go and visit him in prison. And it looks as though that Onesiphorus might have been killed, because Paul pays tribute to the household of Onesiphorus. So Paul expected people to come and visit him, despite how dangerous it was. And we ought to think about that. We ought to think about, you know, uh, you know uh, our, our fears of uh, going places which might be dangerous for fear of what might happen. If you truly believe that, you know, your life is entrusted with God and that God's got you in the palm of his hands and it's the will of God, you, you oughtn't be afraid of what man can do or where you can go. And Paul expects us to put our faith on the line. Verse 10, he says, Demas has forsaken me. Christian has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Only Luke's with me. And, you know, you'd respond and say, well, well that's because you're in prison, Paul. And, and, and Nero's nuts. And, and it's really dangerous. But Paul's saying, no, I, I want you to come and visit me and see me. Do diligence to come and visit me. Because Paul's life he knew was wrapped up in, in the Lord's hand and he knew that the Lord stood by him and he knew that the Lord would stand by anybody that was prepared to what I would call invest in their faith, step out of the boat, take a step into the uncomfort zone. So as, he stay, as he's there on death row in verse 16, he says, 
at my defense, no one came to stand by me. They all forsook me and fled. Doesn't that sound familiar? All my disciples forsook me and fled. No one came to stand by me at my first defense. I was on my own. That's Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Paul say, may it not be charged against them. That's a statement of mercy. Jesus' second statement, a statement of hope. Paul says in verse 8, Henceforth there's a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, the righteous judge will award me in that day. Isn't that the same language? Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And a second statement like is there in Second Timothy. A statement of love. You know, when Paul got, uh, when Jesus, sorry, got John and Mary, Mary was outside the realm of the disciples. And he was so concerned of her position outside the realm of the disciples that he appointed her to be given to John. And John was going to bring her back into the realm of the disciples. Paul makes the same appeal of love when he turns around in 2 Timothy concerning John Mark. Remember the fallout with John Mark? Who was outside the realm of Paul's disciples and had a big Barney with Barney over John Mark? It was laughter then. That was actually quite good. So get John Mark and bring him with you for he's useful for me for the ministry. And here is him saying, Timothy, go and get John Mark and bring him with you. There's Mary and John at the cross. A beautiful statement of love. Of trust. An incredible statement of trust. Think about Jesus with the Lord coming down at the cross. Verse 17, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Beautiful statement of trust. Desire. When you come, bring the cloak I left with you at Carpus and at Troas, also the books, but most of all, above anything else, the most important thing of anything, Timothy, bring the parchment. Bring the parchments. Blessed is he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness. There was Paul, his, his greatest desire on death row was that Timothy might bring the parchments with him. And finally, triumph. Well, not finally. But triumph, the sixth saying, it is finished. I have fought the good fight. I have finished. It is done. I have kept the faith. And then the last saying of dedication from the cross, Paul says, For I am ready, as it should be, to be poured out as a drink offering. My departure is at hand. I am ready. Into thy hands I commit my spirit to be poured out as a drink offering before the Lord. A statement of dedication. All seven statements of Jesus are found in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And the reason why is because these statements for Paul and for Stephen, they become a way of life. It is, isn't it? That story of mercy, hope, love, trust, desire, triumph, dedication. It's been wonderful, brothers and sisters, to be able to share some of these things with you on the seven sayings from the cross. They, they really are powerful. They are a story of the life of a man who is, was completely, absolutely dedicated to his father and gave us an example, a real powerful, positive example to follow. A way of life built on the foundation of of mercy. 
established on the principle that God forgave us when we were unforgivable. And then built on the incredible promise of hope that he's going to give us something beyond what we could ever imagine. Reconciliation to be able to walk and talk in the beauties of holiness free from this body of death. And he's demonstrated that by the incredible love of his son. And we ought to be able to do the same thing in our love one towards another. And as we grow, we're going to learn to trust in our father, to know that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And we, when we understand that principle, that God will never leave us nor forsake us, we won't be afraid of what people say or what people do or where we go. doesn't matter, does it? It really doesn't matter. What matters is when it's all torn down, it's, it's our relationship with God. That's the only thing that's going to matter. And when we understand that, we'll grow in an insatiable thirst, a desire more and more and more that we just won't be able to get enough a passion and a love for God's word. And you can see it in the older generation. Younger, gener younger people, you should take note of the older generation and their love and their passion for the word of God as they get closer and closer to the end of their pilgrimage. All that matters. They can see it clearer and clearer. All that matters is their relationship with God and their love for his word and the love for the promises that are in it. And then finally... And when you witness it in a life that's lived to the full, when you see a life that's lived in its relationship with God, you can almost see a person at peace with his end. It is finished. I have done what I could do. I know that God is going to give me a reward, not because of my righteousness, but because of what he's done through Jesus Christ. And then we're ready to give our lives every moment back to God. Because every moment that we've ever breathed and ever lived has been God's gift to us that we might give it back to him.